<laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's briefing on perspectives on Medicare sustainability with uh, former CMS administrators, Nancy Ann DeParle and Mark McClellan, um, as well as uh, Mr. Tom Scully. I am Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy, and for those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the health policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. We're really thrilled to have former CMS administrators here with us today as we discuss the past, present, and future of the Medicare program. Uh, we are looking forward to a lively discussion today, and we also want to hear from you, so I'm going to be inviting questions throughout the broadcast. Um, and we especially thank you all for joining us on this morning when, um, as we all recognize, there has been uh, some um, major news coming out of the Supreme Court, so we're um, we're excited to have your focus with us um, for this next hour as we talk about the future of Medicare. The Alliance was fortunate to have hosted a series earlier this year on the future of Medicare that provided foundational education about the mechanisms of the Medicare program to help policymakers and other decision makers consider the trade-offs of policy options to promote Medicare sustainability and affordability. And for more information, uh, please visit us at allhealthpolicy.org and you can check out um, the Future of Medicare series um, there with um, lots and lots of background. Um, you can join our conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive, our community at All Health Policy, and on Facebook and LinkedIn. So um, with that being said, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna move quickly because we've got a lot of content to cover. Um, if you have questions, please do submit them using the dashboard on the right side of your screen that has a speech bubble icon with a question mark. Um, if you have tech issues or anything like that, check um, chat those in with there as well. And now um, I'm very excited to introduce former CMS Administrator and Alliance Board Chair, um, Tom Scully, to introduce the panelists. And if I may, I will also note that um, um, Mr. Scully has a, uh, a brand new title this uh, as, as of this week, which is of grandfather. So congratulations and um, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> really old. I'm about, I'm about to become a Medicare great. beneficiary in a few months, so I don't know. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we are looking forward to hearing your perspectives on this really important issue. And um, I'm going to now turn it over to you to introduce um, our terrific uh, two um, fellow panelists. Thanks. Well, yeah, I just want to introduce Nancy Ann and, and uh, Mark. We're both very, very young, long time. You can't say old friends, very long time friends. And one of the many nice things about the healthcare policy world is that it's, uh, it's uh, we're all there's a small group of people within the CMS administrators, and these guys have all had the White House jobs too, as I did, and we're all friends, and it's not a particularly partisan group, and we all care about healthcare policy, and we've been friends for a long time. So going back to Leonard Schaefer, who was the see, the HICFA administrator back in Carter, and Bill Roper, who did it for uh, Ronald Reagan, we still have dinner together all the time, we're friends, and it's kind of the way things should be, and uh, it's kind of nice. So I really appreciate you both coming. They both have resumes that could kill the whole hour, so I won't go into that. Uh, I will start with Nancy Ann first. Nancy Ann was actually the HICFA administrator, believe it or not, showing that some of this may, I'm old enough to remember HICFA. I was the HICFA administrator in about a week. But uh, Nancy Ann is, they're probably, Mark and Nancy Ann are probably the two most accomplished healthcare policy people in Washington in the last 30 years. And um, Nancy Ann was a lawyer in Washington for many years, uh, went to University of Tennessee, where I think she was president of her class, and then one of her class, and then went to Harvard Law School, practiced law for a while, and then went to uh, OMB, where I also worked uh, for a long time, and then was the HICFA administrator under um, uh, President Clinton for a number of years. We became very good friends back then. I actually replaced her. I was actually the administrator of HICFA for about a month until we changed the name to CMS. I'm still not sure why, but anyway. Uh, and then Nancy Ann has gone, gone up and done a number of other things, but uh, among other things, she obviously was uh, 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 the CMS administrator, but then she came back as the uh, White House Deputy Chief of Staff and spent uh, most of the Obama administration running way broader things than healthcare. So the, very few people in Washington have ever touched healthcare policy as many ways as she's been. As she has uh, most recently, she's been a very effective and successful private equity investor, in, mainly in New York, the same business I'm in, and uh, has done incredibly well at that. But uh, nobody on the Democratic side has anywhere near the history of health care and health policy and CMS slash HICFA that the NCN has. Uh, on the Republican side, Mark, I've also known for a very long time. Um, Mark also has 800 degrees, most of them from Harvard, MD, MBA, he's got a zillion of them. I can't read them all. So they're all on the website, but uh, he is a long 
the time, healthcare policy expert. Uh, when I went to run CMS in 2001, Mark was the White House health policy deputy, and I had to report to him, so I couldn't do anything without asking him. And then uh, he left after a couple of years and went to be the FDA administrator for a few years. And then when I left CMS, it was a little brief break in the time, but he then went to run CMS after I did. So he has had every meaningful job in uh, HHS and, uh, and Washington health policy. Uh, he's now at Duke of the Margolis Center. He's got m- multiple other jobs at Brookings. But uh, there's virtually nothing in the last 30 years in healthcare policy that one of these, that either or both, in many cases, both of them at the same time didn't have a big hand in. So as far as the history of CMS and how it works, as well as the history of Congress and Medicare and Medicaid policy and exchanges and Obamacare, which Nancy Ann was incredibly involved in. Uh, Mark and I were very involved in doing the Medicare drug benefit, Medicare Advantage. I think we kind of we kind of did a lot of cooking that up when we first got there. So it's, it's hard to find a major health policy that these guys don't have their fingerprints all over. So you couldn't possibly find two better people to talk about CMS and uh, healthcare policy and where it's going. And even better, they're still good friends. So that's a quick introduction, I hope. But thank you guys for doing this very much. Great. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to your perspectives. Um, I'd love to start off, and Tom, while we have you, I'd like, like to actually get everybody's thoughts on this. Um, so you walk in the door, you're, you know, HICFA, um, which is, by the way, that was Healthcare Financing Administration um, back in the day, um, and now CMS. So you walk in the door, you're the administrator, you're responsible for not only, um, it's worth noting, not only the Medicare program, but also Medicaid, now um, the, you know, many components of the private insurance market. Um, but but I just want to kind of focus on, on Medicare. You know, we talk a lot about in health policy, we talk about policy, we talk about transformation, we talk about sustainability, right? Like that's what we're here to talk about. But oftentimes, I think sometimes the operational piece gets lost. And so I actually want to start um, with what sometimes gets left as an afterthought, which is that operational piece, you know? And Tom, let me sort of turn to you first, right? Like you're of course on the Alliance's board, a tiny nonprofit, you're on many other boards, you see companies kind of um, rise and fall. What, when you talk about, when you think about Medicare sustainability um, and, and, and sort of implementing um, change, what does it take at an operational level to, um, to really succeed in a program like Medicare, as large as Medicare and that covers so many, um, so many beneficiaries. CMS is a big place, bigger than it was when Nancy and I, and I ran it, uh, and Mark, but it's, uh, it's a lot of people don't realize it's actually 95% it's in Baltimore, well, there are a lot of regional offices, but there's probably 6,000 people in Baltimore, a big campus. Uh, it is very apolitical, at least as far as I'm concerned, the career staff, they have been there for a long time. They, 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 they you know, outlast the political people. <laughs> they do their job to make the program run. Well, you know, I think in many cases, it's a wonderful place. It really is not really stuck in the politics of Washington. They're really focused on running the Medicare and Medicaid program. So as far as running CMS, it's just a big place. Uh, you can spend, you know, all, it's, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. So it's just, it's very hard to run. But I think it was wonderful. It was as much fun as I've ever had in the three and a half years I did it. Um, but to get policy change is much different. So, and I think and I'll let these guys dive into this, but... You know, you're up in Baltimore, the CMS administrators are in Washington a lot of the time. But to get something changed, you got to deal with Congress, you got to deal with all the department, including ASPE, and everybody at the department wants, you know, the vast bulk of the money at HHS, and a lot of the money in federal government, probably a third of it, is coming through this agency and a lot of the policy decisions. So if you want to change something, you got to, you have to navigate all of HHS and the Secretary's office and OMB, where we, all of us work, and the White House, and everybody wants a piece of it. And it's just difficult. And we've talked to Chiquita about that, who's the current administrator, a friend of all of ours. It's just difficult. I think it's actually easier as Republicans, because I hate to say this, Mark, I probably agree on this. There aren't as many Republicans, there aren't as many cooks in the kitchen with Republicans. So it's a lot, usually a little more streamlined. In the Democratic Party, there's lots more people who care about healthcare policy generally. So when you're the CMS administrator, there's a thousand people who want to affect what decision you're making, whether it's a regulation, whether it's legislative. So it's a big place. I think it's a wonderful place. I think the career staff are terrific. I think a lot of them have been there for a long time and are really look at themselves as safeguarding, you know, safeguarding the programs. But if you actually want to make uh, any serious regulatory change and really any legislative change, it's tough. And Nancy Ann did an amazing job, obviously, uh, on Obamacare. I think Mark and I hopefully made some significant changes through Medicare Part D and Medicare Advantage 20 years ago, but it was hard and that couldn't happen very often. So it's a big ship to turn. It's hard to manage. Uh, it's heavily, you know, career oriented. And uh, as far as the staff, I think when I was there, I had 10 political staff and 6,000 career staff. So 
I think just as an introduction, yeah, it's a wonderful place, but it's a big place and it's a good challenging place. And I'll stop with that and let these guys jump in. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah, Nancy, and what are your thoughts? As, and, and I'd love to hear your, your perspectives too on like whether you think things have changed through the years or you know, are, this, are the fundamentals kind of still the same? Sure, um, and you're bringing back uh, memories and I'm sitting here sweating because I remember, um, I, I have a memory of sitting in Bruce Flattick's, the, the administrator's conference room in Washington, which both of these guys know well. And I was not yet the administrator. Uh, Donna Shalala, the secretary, asked me to come over from my job at OMB a couple of months before Bruce left, so there would be a transition. Um, and I was sitting there and we were going over the um, several hundred provisions of the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, uh, which you know, extended the Medicare Trust Fund 30 years, uh, and which CMS was supposed to implement, HECFA was supposed to implement, um, and it had new prospective payment systems for skilled nursing facilities and, and um, you know, outpatient care in hospitals and all of that and implementing the, the state children's health insurance program. And I was sitting there sweating in that room, the building, the air conditioning in that brutalist um, building is not great. So I was thinking, is that why I'm sweating? What's going on? I looked at Bruce Flattick. He looked great. He was just sitting there, looked all relaxed. Every and so after the meeting, I took him aside and I said, this sounds terrible. This is going to be, you know, how are we going to get this done? And he said, you don't get it, do you? Um, I said, T please enlighten me. He said, I'm out of here. <laughs> Good luck. Um, and that's a little bit what it was like. Uh, you, you said that about what do you feel like walking in the building, but I'll tell you the thing that has not changed in my view and, and was the secret sauce of that agency is the people. That's what you need when you say, how do you do all this? You know, Tom described the difficult processes that you have to go through. It's the people. And, you know, Tom, you may be on to something. Uh, I'm glad you didn't move the headquarters when you changed the name uh, because Having in Baltimore may be part of the secret sauce because people in the cafeteria there aren't buzzing around about the limos around, you know, going from place to place for, for meetings and presidential movements. They're in there, they're talking about policy and talking about serving beneficiaries and how to make the program work better. And it was really a highlight of my professional life working with them. They, I just, um, they're, they're doing this work day in and day out without enough resources, meaning people, but with incredible heart and incredible um, intelligence. And they're the type of people that, you know, when I show up and we're implementing the balanced budget, if I said we need to go to the moon, I need to go tomorrow, um, there'd be a team of people, one of whom would be brave enough to say, that's a stupid idea and you shouldn't do it. <laughs> and others who would say, it is a dumb idea, but if you need to do it, here's the three options for how you can do it. And here's how long it will take, and here's how much it will cost, et cetera. And so um, that's what I think is the secret of, of the agency, is the people that are there. And they're there because of the mission. The, you know, the reason all of us are here, because they really care about providing um, health care and the, the social contract around it, which is what Medicare I think, uh, which achieves its highest expression in Medicare. Thank you. Okay, so uh, folks who work at CMS, if you're listening, huge shout out to the public service that you're doing day in and day out. Um, really, really important work. Mark, what are your perspectives? Well, I just would reinforce what you heard from Nancy Ann and Tom. It's the, the mission commitment of the people who are there that makes the place work. And it is such a wonderful place to work because the programs that you oversee matter so much to every American. If they're not a Medicare, Medicaid, or now uh, ACA exchange beneficiary, they've got a parent or someone close to them uh, who is. And the uh, programs make such a huge difference in people's lives. Um, I, I do want to emphasize along with that the the willingness and of the staff to, to to rise to meet new challenges as healthcare changes. You know, I um, went to CMS as Tom said after the Medicare modern just after the Medicare Modernization Act had been 
passed and had that was my um, uh, charge to implement kind of the equivalent of um, uh, what Nancy Ann was describing with the Balanced Budget Act and, and changes implemented then to try to keep the, the program up to date financially and the changing night nature of uh, medical services provided. You know, Medicare previously hadn't covered prescription drugs. That was like 2006 when uh, um, that took effect, 2004 when uh, uh, I went over and we started to implement. Um, I'd come from FDA, which was also a very mission-driven place, but one with a, a somewhat different kind of culture because it came out of, uh, um, your, your legislative participants will know this, but it comes from the pe public health um, act, uh, public health act that oversees the nation's public health agencies. Um, CMS, previously HICFA, had come out of the Social Security Administration, which um, had as its original culture um, being accurate and uh, uh, correct with paying out um, for critical either Social Security benefits or, or medical services. And what's happened with, with CMS over time, I think this is reflected in the, the name change, is um, more of an evolution to not only thinking about are we paying accurately, but also thinking about what kind of difference is the way we pay making in how healthcare is delivered. I remember my first talk to the CMS employees after getting there from, from FDA and was really excited about the opportunity, aware of the challenges. For example, we were going to cover prescription drugs. We didn't have, I think, any pharmacists on our uh, on our staff uh, so there's a big you know billion dollar appropriation for our implementation support staffing redesign and and outreach um, to beneficiaries related to the program and remember telling the staff you know you are the nation's largest public health agency because the the way that you pay makes such a difference for people's health. And we got a, a bit of applause. Then you know, one of my advisors took me aside afterwards and said, you know, Mark, we're, we're actually under the Social Security Act. You're not at FDA anymore. I said, well, the point is that, that things are changing. And if you look at a lot of the uh, new challenges that CMS staff have risen to meet, uh, it's increasingly about Again, paying attention to getting the payments right, not overpaying, not paying inappropriately, being financially responsible, but also I think sustainability, just like it is in every other aspect of business, it's not only about like how much did you spend, how much did you make, what was your net revenues at the end of the year, but, but what are you doing to, uh, to make this program really work in the world for the long term? And that's increasingly, a challenging part of the job at CMS. And, you know, I, I wish the resources to support the agency were keeping up with that. Just as a, for example, you know, coverage of treatments like um, Aduhelm have been in the news lately. Well, if you look at the staff that's overseeing everything to do with new technologies and coverage, um, there are fewer people there, Sarah, with advanced degrees and, and you know, technical backgrounds now than there were when I was administrator. So they're having to do a lot with very limited resources with a job that just gets more important uh, and more complex as healthcare continues to advance. Mm, thanks. I'm, I'm really glad you raised that because that was definitely going to be m one of my questions. And you also ran, of course, the FDA. And so you're, you know, you're, you've really been on the vanguard of, of uh, medical and scientific advancements, Nancy, and with your role in, you know, investment, like you're looking at sort of the changing landscape of healthcare. So mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about the operation, but let's, let's, let's actually talk about that now. Like the, the changing context of healthcare and healthcare delivery is CMS you know, are we set up, um, and, and I'll say CMS as an agency, but like the Medicare program itself, right? Like we went through this in our 101 a few weeks ago, we talked about part A, B, C, you know, of course, Medicare Advantage, D, the, the drug benefit, right? Like all of these things were kind of built upon one another. Um, I, you know, I mean, we, we know that all these things are involve a lot of trade-offs. It can be very political, it's policy-wise very challenging, but like, are we set up for success to deliver on, um, you know, the changing landscape of healthcare and like, feel free to bring in, you know, the, the latest public health crisis we face, right, which is COVID, right? Like I think about even just the fact that we needed to make a special decision, um, um, a, a one among many, for example, to cover like COVID tests at the pharmacy, for example. So I'm, I'm curious, like, 
again, from your standpoint as former CMS administrators, like putting this in the context now of the future of healthcare technology, innovation, scientific advancement, but also care delivery. What are your well, thoughts? I actually think that's a great, um, a great example is the way the agency has worked during the pandemic. I mean, there is that decision that was made by the agency um, using authority they had. Um, they made decisions to quickly allow um, critical access hospitals, for example, to provide um, telehealth uh, because people couldn't come to the hospital. And that was a weird area where the telehealth statute itself, they thought they had expanded, Congress thought they'd expanded it, but it didn't help critical access hospitals because they're in a different statute. So there are things that, that the agency was flexible about. Um, they created this um, designation called hospital without walls in order to be able to handle that. I'm sure uh, there were people who were uncomfortable as they, as they stretched and reached to do this, but they did that because they knew they needed to keep um, Medicare beneficiaries um, in the forefront. And somehow, without being in the office together up there in Baltimore, doing it just like we are today, they figured that out. So I think that's a good example. And another good example is uh, the CMS Center for Innovation. And before that was there, we could only do demonstrations that that con Congress, you know, statutorily allowed us to do. So we weren't keeping up with anything. We were way behind. Um, lots of people in the business world or, or in healthcare policy world would come to us with ideas. We couldn't do anything about them because we were, you know, I can remember my first day someone sort of lecturing me on Medicare covers only those items and services that are reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of a disease or a malformed body member. That's the statute. That was it. Um, nothing experimental, nothing, you know, so we've come a long way from there. And I think the Center for Innovation, which Sarah, you you previewed that I've said, I think there's some, some uh, um, bipartisan um, solutions to some of the problems of sustainability. I think the Innovation Center is a place where there is bipartisan work, where uh, we saw Secretary Price, who had, had you know, moved and been a driving force behind repealing the Affordable Care Act 50 times or something before he came to be secretary. But when he got there as secretary, he saw the value in the Innovation Center. And if anything, they doubled down on some of the ideas about moving toward value, moving towards um, more collaborative and ongoing partnerships with a broader group of stakeholders, um, strengthening patient engagement, all of those things are bipartisan. So I actually think the agency does now have some of the tools it needs to do that. Yeah, if I could just uh, build on a, a couple of points here that, that Nancy Ann made. Um, first of all, with respect to COVID, I think when we get a little bit more distance from this pandemic, if we're ever able to you know, take a deep dive through like a bipartisan commission or something like that. I think what people are going to find is that the CMS part of the response, even though they're not a public health agency, was hugely important in limiting the impact of the pandemic. You know, Nancy Ann mentioned the rapid flexibilities that went into place that enabled healthcare to move from where it was in hospitals out to home and to support telehealth and other things that, that were, were instrumental in enabling the healthcare system to respond, uh, um, serving as a, a catalyst for a lot of the extra payments that went to hospitals in addition to all that flexibility. And just the important thing to remember about Medicare and CMS programs is general, in general is that they're so important for the overall healthcare system that what happens in those programs influences the rest of the healthcare system. So um, if CMS hadn't taken these steps, I don't think you would have seen as much response on the private sector side, or at least as much impact in, in this big shift that we saw in the way that care was delivered in the pandemic. And CMS has also helped shape some of the public health response too. You know, pandemics used to be mainly about so-called non-medical interventions like isolation, and we still have all that in uh, COVID, but we're now living in an era 
with all of the progress in synthetic biology that you can expect, as Nancy Ann mentioned, you know, tests that can identify an infection within days of that infection being discovered or isolated. You know, we can do this for any major respiratory infection today. Treatments that can be developed within weeks to a few months. Vaccines that can be developed. You know, the the um, federal government's plan now for future preparedness of within 100 days, even faster than the incredible time for development for the COVID vaccines. And it was the CMS programs, not only the, the new kinds of payment, you know, CMS is not good as re for reasons that, that Nancy Ann said, for historical reasons, for paying for, you know, emergency treatments, um, even preventive treatments like vaccines, but they found ways to do it, working with Congress and otherwise, and also served as a big support for new kinds of data sharing. So uh, information going from um, CMS about their Medicare beneficiaries to state public health authorities who could identify you know, where are the pockets where people aren't getting access to vaccines and to, to guide uh, clinicians and the, the Medicare Advantage health plans on, uh, on targeting their efforts as well. And we're at a point now where you know, we're moved, we've moved beyond this kind of acute part of the pandemic, but COVID is still with us. We're still having you know, a steady stream of cases. We could have more recurrent uh, outbreaks. And I think CMS policies are gonna be even more important going forward. It's CMS policies that are enabling the data collection and data sharing related to how tests are being used and how cases are occurring, uh, the, the, the CMS payments that have facilitated the new treatments are going to be very important even after the, the public health emergency ends. It's just a critical agency, increasingly so for the nation's public health. And you know, with respect to innovation, it still is challenging. And you know, Nancy Ann's right, the Innovation Center has helped get care up to date, um, but you know, we still haven't fundamentally changed the statute for things like um, very um, prevention-oriented treatments. Those either need an act of Congress or they have to go through this extensive process with the um, uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to be covered. If you look ahead, we've got a lot more early diagnostic technologies coming for cancer, for all kinds of other genetically mediated conditions. Um, and the, it's still not a great fit with those benefit categories that were designed in, in 1965. So a lot of creative work by the staff having to continue to keep it up to date. And then just, to, I know in one other topic that I know we wanted to talk about, um, the challenges in health disparities and health equity that have gotten more pronounced uh, in recent years and with the pandemic. Well, there are a lot of steps that the federal government can take, that the private sector can take to do something about it, but CMS with its authorities under the Innovation Center is probably best positioned of, of any federal agency to make a big difference. There are so many healthcare organizations out there today that are trying to be proactive and reaching out to beneficiaries that have been traditionally hard to reach, that face structural or other barriers to getting care and that the usual models don't work. Um, CMS is now implementing a, a new model in its innovation center called the ACO REACH program that's intended to send, uh, as a high priority to improve equity by trying innovative approaches through the, these digital technologies, through community-based services, through integration with social services, through finding out and addressing barriers to care like transportation or hunger, hard to take your meds, even if they, they're well covered, if you, you're worried about where you're going to eat next. And they're trying to implement programs that will directly uh, help us see whether we can do a better job of that through, a, uh, again, a, a, the next generation of, of redesigned healthcare. And we really need answers uh, to these kinds of questions. And it's, it's great to see, again, CMS potentially leading the way for, for our healthcare system uh, in keeping it up to date with the challenges of the day, which, which very much include health equity. Right. And uh, I have three other words for you, conditions of participation. So, <laughs> you know, that's how Medicare was uh, the original um, impetus to desegregate hospitals in this country back in 1965. Um, by, by, by using the conditions of participation, uh, Medicare has been able to make changes. Uh, for example, uh, in 2009, I believe, um, 
requiring hospitals who for the most part were very open to this, but to allow uh, domestic partners to, to visit at the hospital, whereas their rules before had said, you know, only the spouse could be there. So there's lots of things they're doing in that way to, and I think, you know, using that as part of getting all the healthcare workers vaccinated. I mean, they, they've been very creative, um, uh, but as Mark says, the statute is somewhat constraining. So there's a limit to how, to how much they can do. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I'm hearing what I'm hearing or think I'm at least interpreting is, is Medicare is this um, vehicle for, you know, in some ways really driving change to um, help dismantle some of the structural inequities that have happened in the healthcare system. Um, you know, whether that be people who have um, lived with racism or um, other forms of discrimination and that there's there's this opportunity to make some changes at a, at a structural level um, when, when people um, get to the Medicare program. Um, I want to pull on another thread, though, that you guys mentioned, which is, and, and Mark, you gave some really interesting history about um, uh, kind of the the culture of, you know, the the sort of dollars and cents, you know, making sure we're paying correctly, not overpaying, stewarding the public taxpayer dollar, et cetera, um, in the Medicare program. But then also you, you really emphasize Medicare's kind of evolving role as a public health agency. And so like when we think about this conversation about sustainability, like so often, again, the trustees are focused on like, this is the hospital insurance trust fund, the part A, like when does the money run out? Is there um, is there a broader concept of sustainability or stewardship that needs to be constructed in sort of the, the public mindset around like stewarding the health or the health outcomes of Medicare beneficiaries? And that of course includes health equity. Like I, I'm curious, you know, um, of course, Medicare is also a driver of quality and outcomes measures, but can you talk about that piece of it as well? Like. How, what can um, Medicare beneficiaries expect in terms of the program stewardship of, um, you know, driving the system in a way that um, that actually improves health and health outcomes, um, yeah, in addition to, to stewarding the taxpayer dollars? Glad to, and I'd like to hear Nancy Ann's per perspective on this too. You know, if you ask any company today about sustainability, of course they're going to tell you about, well, you know, here's our here's our financial plan, and how we're not going to have losses and uh, be able to continue and and you know hopefully grow. Uh, but they're also going to tell you about environmental impact and community impact and things like that that, that really are important for long-term success. And that's I think increasingly finding its way into the way Way Medicare does its work. Um, if you read the, the annual trustees report, which are supposed to report in on the condition of the trust funds, those are still pretty financially focused, but they are increasingly also talking about some of these health goals. And I think that is one of the, uh, the challenges that, that Medicare is working through now and that CMS is working through is on the one hand, look, these programs are incredibly costly. You know, we're talking about 5% of the nation's GDP between Medicare and Medicaid and the ACA exchanges. So we absolutely have to be sure we're spending that money well. But at the same time, um, we're also seeing, if you look at the, the health of the population in this country, you've got all these great technologies coming along, like I was uh, uh, alluding to earlier, some of them working better than others, but, but definitely great treatments for cancer, uh, better drugs and treatments for cardiovascular disease, um, better procedures that enable people to recover the function of their limbs and uh, and get past pain and, and, and so forth. But if you look at our actual national statistics, they're not looking great. You know, we had a big decline in life expectancy with COVID, but we weren't heading in a good direction on life expectancy before that. And we've had these big uh, challenges in, in health equity emerge too, as well as challenges in um, uh, for for lower income Americans particularly in 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 rural areas minority and 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 otherwise so that's getting appropriately a lot of attention so we can just keep spending the money the same way we, we we've been doing it um, you know maybe that's good for financial sustainability but it's not good for uh, population health. So what I'm hoping we'll see more of is, you know, we, we got to keep tracking the trust funds and the trust fund that everybody pays attention to is Medicare Part A because that has a specific dedicated payroll tax. But people remember that there's also Medicare Part B, Medicare Part D, and those are a, a larger and faster growing parts of Medicare because that includes outpatient services, physicians, drugs, uh, et cetera, that are very important 
for the future of medicine and became even more so during the, the, the pandemic. So I think it's important to look at the total spending in these programs and, and are there ways to make that uh, more financially sustainable, but link that up to where Medicare, I think, is really trying to head. If you uh, listen to the leadership of, of CMS, and, and again, the staff, I, I think, really believes this, that they're really trying to focus on getting the best health experience at the person level. So they've set this goal of by 2030, having every be Medicare beneficiary, hopefully everybody in our healthcare system, in a uh, comprehensive care relationship with a like a primary care provider provider or, or whatever works best for that person that's going to help them coordinate their health care needs and, um, and, and work their way much more easily through what has become a very complex and fragmented health care system because we have been looking at it so much piece by piece. And you know, some of the new programs like that ACO REACH program that I mentioned are important steps in figuring out, well, what's the best way to do that, to, uh, to, to make it easier for, for Medicare beneficiaries, especially those with limited means who have had trouble making their way through an increasingly complex healthcare system with lots of different co-pays, how do they get a better overall experience? So we're, we're very much in that process. This is not done. We've had, you know, fragmented funding to begin with. This is not resolved, um, but very important for the sustainability of the program to shift, to continue to shift this focus to spending at the person level and, and results, outcomes, equity at the person and population level. You know, Mark, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I'm a student of the trustees reports like you are and you know, read them carefully and have for years. And, and as I mentioned, the Balanced Budget Act, which um, the agency implemented while I was there, extended the trust fund solvency from 01 to 2030, which was a big achievement. But you're only looking at part A, the hospital insurance um, part of the program. You're not looking at the whole thing. And I think the Innovation Center strategy, um, you highlighted the part about driving accountable care um, and I would also highlight the part about embed embedding health equity in all models through, through requiring reporting of demographic and social determinants of health data. Those are things that I think are going to drive towards sustainability. So maybe what we should be had, that the annual trustees report is a good time to have a conversation like the one we're having, but the conversation should be broader and it should be about um, the return on investment to borrow a, to borrow a term from my from my current world, you know, we're investing. These are investments we're making. The American people are making when they pay their HI tax and the employer pays his or her share of it. That's an investment in your future health care. What are the returns on that investment? And we want it to be more equitable, higher quality, um, more efficient health care. Are we getting that? That should be the conversation, I think, not so narrowly focused on how many years of solvency do the actuaries think we have? Um, so that's something, Sarah, I think that the Alliance has done a good job of um, year in, year out, focusing policymakers and those who who uh, care about policy on. And I'm, I'm glad you're doing it because it's very important. I will say as a former budget official, um, I, I've spoken with several others who have been uh, focused on the budget side of things over the years, who have all had a similar reflection, a feeling a little um, queasy, honestly, about um, the extent to which um, maybe budgetary concerns um, could have, I think didn't in this case, but could have um, hurt our efforts to be able to respond to this public health emergency that we had. because. It's one thing to focus in on, you know, is this payment, is this particular payment system uh, paying appropriately or is it overpaying? And, you know, is it market basket minus one or market basket minus point, whatever. You can get very into the weeds and details. And, but then when you go up a few, you know, feet, you start to look at, okay, in this community, uh, in this rural area, What's there for people if we had a public health emergency? Is that hospital, a, you know, are the margins sufficient to keep that hospital open? And I think Medicare, um, 
as as our as our American you know co social contract with seniors, we all we all pay into it. I think it has a broader responsibility to keep those assets there to, to supply the graduate medical education mark for you know uh, to to help with staffing and that's part of what we're paying for. So the conversation needs to be um, broader than just focused on the little individual payment systems and whether they're accurate or not. Mm. So I, I, I want to ask you my favorite question, right? Um, I, I'm loving this conversation, which is um, what would need to be true to make that broader conversation happen? I mean, we have like wonderful, brilliant, you know, trustees. We have these systems set up to kind of look at the system in a certain way. And so this is kind of the pie in the sky question, if you will, right? Because like you've got as you know, you were you were at OMB too. Like you've got budget people who are who have rules and constraints. You've got folks on the hill that have a certain culture and you know, like also have constraints. They have to run stuff by CBO. They can't just be like, well, let's look at the budget and you know, did we also reduce heart attacks? Like there's there there we don't really have those structures and systems in place necessarily. So what I'm curious to hear from you is like like what would need to be true? What obstacles would need to be removed? What what would need to be true in terms of relationships or ways of thinking or like new structures? Do we need a Medicare, you know, beneficiary council just as much as we have a trustees, you know, as a set of hmm. trustees? Like like if you if you were to think creatively and without constraints, like where would you go? You know what I thought about when you were describing that, um, and this is the way you think sometimes as a CMS administrator. Well, is there anything that says I can't do that? Uh, and you know, people will give you advice about whether it's prudent to do something or not. But in, I think something like that, I don't think there's any reason why the trustees report couldn't be broader. Yes, it has to have all the information, the low, medium, high, and all, all forecast, et cetera, and all the actuarial work that's done. But I don't see why it couldn't also have a report on Part B and a report on Part C and a report on Part D and a report on uh, the Innovation Center and what it's doing to advance Medicare. Um, I don't know why it couldn't have that. And in fact, I would argue that it probably should. When I was at OMB, um, one of my mentors was the well, first deputy director, then the director, Alice Rivlin, and she decided we needed to have a um, citizens' um, version of the budget. And it took some work to get everyone to agree to do this, but instead of, so we did the typical, you know, several feet of budget documents every year that are required by statute. And then we did a special report that was maybe 10 or 12 pages that explained to the American people why they should care about the budget and what it said about our national priorities. I don't know if it's continued, but something like that I think would be useful with respect to Medicare. You know, we have the building blocks for doing that. There are reports that come out of other parts of HHS, in many cases, based on data collected from CMS. And like I was saying, the, the, the public health relevant data from CMS during the, the pandemic have been just critical for under, understanding what's going on in the country in terms of disease, you know, COVID burden, mm -hmm. and treatment and vaccines and, and hospitalizations and, and so forth. But we haven't really put it together. And, you know, in my job at, at at Duke working on healthcare reform and Nancy Ann's, you know, getting to see a lot of the innovative organizations out there in healthcare. What you're increasingly seeing in those organizations that are again really trying to be forward thinking about how do we best pe meet our patients' needs, our whole population's need at the at, at the lowest overall cost. They are tracking these things. They're tracking the the, the overall cost of care that they're providing. They're um, they're tracking the the costs that are going into different pieces of care, you know, inpatient, home-based care, and so forth, with the latter getting bigger, you know, being an explicit goal in many cases, you know, more primary care, more home-based mm -hmm. care. But they're also tracking outcomes that are relevant for those same populations. And we've been recommending for a while, and I think CMS has been talking some lately about starting to produce, not just for people in the, uh, for beneficiaries in these, you know, nice uh, innovative innovation center programs, but maybe for like the whole population, um, not just like how much are we spending on say Medicare Part B or Medicare Part D, but what is it, what is it costing now to take care of a, a beneficiary with a particular 
particular kind of health problem, with um, severe cardiovascular disease, or with a particular type of cancer, or with uh, back pain, uh, and matching that up with some indicators of just how good the, the care is. You know, what's the and what the variation is. <laughs> and what variation a, kind of yeah, outcomes this, are you getting? Because that's what's going to give you the answer to this, the, the real answer to the sustainability question. Um, you know, if we just try to cut Medicare spending without paying attention to health, the first thing that's going to happen is Medicare beneficiaries are going to understandably be concerned uh, that they're going to lose access to care they need. On the other hand, if we're taking this more comprehensive approach to thinking about what are we, not only what are we spending, but what are we getting for it, more exactly. at the person level, then I think you're in a much better position to make informed decisions and ones that aren't going to alarm uh, the American American public. I agree, Mark, and I give the industry, uh, whether it's nursing homes or hospitals or physicians, a lot of credit here for being able to take that information. I know that it's sometimes controversial about it being collected, et cetera, but my experience is when you finally put it out there and they see it, what they do um, in this country is they grab that and they want to be better and they work to be better. So. Um, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, anybody who wants to keep Medicare, the you know, these reports the way it is, the payments the way they are, I mean, they just need to look at what's happening to the health of the American public, especially for people with limited means and, and people from minority backgrounds and, and a number of people with pre-existing conditions. If we don't focus more on understanding how well they're doing for, for what we're spending, I think we're going to miss the boat right. on finding effective ways to keep this program up to date. Mm. Right, and I always said when I was administrator, I don't mind spending more as long as we're getting good results. Just, you know, show me that. And and I think we're willing to spend more in this area or that area if you show me that we're getting good results for Medicare beneficiaries. Mm. Well, there was, um, thank you for the, I'm loving this conversation and um, okay, we, we only have about 12 more minutes. See, we, we wanted to do this over lunch, but I think because of COVID, we, <laughs> we had to do this, uh, uh, we had to do it virtually again, but here we are. Um, we want to have you back. You know, from that, I have a couple questions around that. Like um, one is we're getting some audience questions coming in. Um, please share them. There were some complex questions coming in. So I'm asking my staff to kind of um, summarize them for us. But um, I, I don't want to missed the opportunity to um, ask about um, Medicare Advantage um, as well. I mean, Mark, you know, you, you mentioned kind of earlier on this idea of that we heard a lot about the financing driving mm -hmm. kind of how care is delivered and how we're accounting for everything. Medicare Advantage, of course, you know, many plans kind of cover the, the gamut of benefits, inclu some including the prescription drug benefit, some of them separately. That program is growing um, tremendously. And I, I think in some places it's, it's even um, on pace to kind of be, you know, the, 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 the majority of, of Medicare enrollment. I'm curious on both for both of your perspectives on your thoughts on like what is driving that increase and do you see that as a vehicle for advancing some of the goals that you're talking about um you know there's of course also debate around um the 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 the, the payment rates and so on of yeah. ma like how, how do you balance those those kinds of competing concerns in your head well, I think it fits right into the discussion we've just been having. Um, so Medicare Advantage was created with the Medicare Modernization Act as, you know, wasn't just about pr providing prescription drugs, as I was talking about earlier. It's about how do we integrate all of these additional medical technologies around the person in Medicare. And what Medicare Advantage was intended to do was was, was provide at least one option for seniors to roll all that up. So the seniors who choose to go into it, uh, they pay a monthly premium. The plan gets a so-called risk-adjusted payment. You know, it's it, it's a lot more money if you attract and keep someone who has multiple chronic conditions, who frankly has the the most to gain, uh, or, or someone from a low-income background, you know, someone who has the most to gain from this better care coordination, pay a lot more for for plans that that attract and keep those beneficiaries than ones who focus on those who are healthy. So, so risk adjustment is really important and this is 
very important to have as an option for Medicare beneficiaries to get more integrated coverage. And you look at MA, um, you know, sure enough, the, the out-of-pocket costs are lower, uh, beneficiary satisfaction among the beneficiaries who choose it is quite high, and the program is disproportionately enrolling people with more limited means who, you know, can't afford hundreds of dollars in Medigap payments for out-of-pocket costs and who seem to like the additional benefits and, and care coordinators that they're getting and that growth is happening as you said on a, a steady basis I think um, Sarah if you look at beneficiaries who are like fully enrolled including A and B and D um, we're close to 50% of those beneficiaries now and that that's definitely on a track to continue to rise but we do need to get the payments right and because risk adjustment is such an important part of this program, um, there have been some appropriate concerns raised about that being a vehicle, maybe because you know for the um, for the Medicare Advantage beneficiaries, well, their plan has a real incentive to make sure that financial incentive to make sure they're capturing all the diagnoses that those patients have. Whereas in fee for service, it you know it doesn't matter um, so much you know what diagnoses you 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 uh, write down what matters more is like what services you, you bill for, um, which has its own problems. But I think there's some ways to fix um, that, that risk adjustment problem. The best way in the short term might be just doing some corrections, uh, maybe more at the, the plan level. Some plans are doing this more than others, but some corrections for that differential. CMS has some authority uh, to do that now to get the payments more equal, but still continuing to keep track of the outcomes and the experience of people in Medicare Advantage, because that's so important to go along with the spending as we've talked about. And I think for the longer term, um, look, we have better electronic data systems now, and what a lot of the, the leading healthcare organizations, whether they're a health plan or a healthcare system that's trying to do this person-level care, they want to be paid more at this person basis so they can do a lot of things that, as we talked about earlier, Medicare traditionally doesn't cover or doesn't cover well. There's much more flexibility in Medicare Advantage and in some of these alternative payment models like the ACO program and ACO reach to cover broader telehealth, to cover social uh, services that can help people avoid costly emergency room visits and so forth. There should be a path to relying on that electronic data that these organizations are using to keep track of, you know, uh, what conditions does my patient have that I'm actually trying to treat them for and what are their outcomes that same data should be the basis for these risk adjustment systems um, that again it's it's the, the the program has to evolve we can't stay where we are and expect to get any better results for low-income beneficiaries and uh, those with chronic health problems especially if we don't keep moving in this direction yeah and again I couldn't agree more Mark um, you know I was there when we launched uh, Medicare Plus Choice, which was in the Balanced Budget Act and was became Medicare Advantage. The risk adjustment in 97 was primitive. It was a step forward from what the risk contracts had had before, but it was very primitive. Um, it's gotten much better. We should financially incentivize Medicaid, Medicare plans to cover um, sicker, older Medicare beneficiaries. That's a good thing to do. But we should also make sure that they're actually serving them and coming and, and producing results. And I think the mismatch between the financial incentives to do the risk adjustment and to do the coding um, and the lack of as, as sufficient oversight on what's actually happening with the population when you do when you provide the extra money to the plans, I think that's uh, where people have skepticism. But the answer isn't to throw out risk adjustment and put everyone in fee for service. Um, no, the answer is to to really work on making sure that the risk adjustment is appropriate. Not all Medicare Advantage plans are created equal. Let's look at who's doing a good job. I mean, that's part of what the star star rating system was designed to show. Maybe there could be improvements made to that. But uh, to me, that's the answer because uh, for those beneficiaries who have chosen it, it is popular. They are getting benefits they want. Um, we should strengthen that, not not throw it out. Yeah, if there's yeah. one thing that Congress could do, and maybe uh, Nancy Ann, we can find some more bipartisan support for this. If you spend a billion or a couple of billion dollars on helping 
CMS modernize its information systems and get a better infrastructure in place to do these things right. Remember, this is an $800 billion program plus per year. Um, if we really want to enable the agencies, these staff are working really hard and have these important goals. They're seeing what's wrong with American healthcare and, and population health outcomes today, and they're really trying hard to do something about it, especially from an equity standpoint. Um, not that much spending in the big picture could really help improve yeah. their ability and the transparency around all of this, the quality of the data, um, inform those trustees reports and, and, and other program improvement activities could, could really help move us in the right direction. We, we can't stay in fee for service and expect to get better results either from a spending standpoint or a, an outcome standpoint. Well, the data is so lagged, and you're right. It used used to be a bragging point that um, Medicare's administrative costs were less than one percent of the of the pie, and I'm sure that's still the case. So they do need more resources to do the things that we're talking about. Yeah, um, this is great. I, I want to um, acknowledge that we have about a um, little bit less than five minutes left, and this is such a um, an awesome discussion. There's been so, there's been a, an interesting question in the audience um, that I'm going to try to weave into my final question. So here we go. You are two of the most um, well versed people, really, in the country, in the world about the um, the Medicare program. Um, if you were sitting down at the kitchen table of um, a senior or person with a disability, a Medicare beneficiary right now, someone's grandma, aunt, uncle, what have you, about the future of this program, you know, maybe they're wondering, we're the richest country in the world. Why can't we afford more benefits? Maybe they're wondering. Why is, you know, why is this so hard to navigate? Maybe they're wondering, like, how do I find a doctor? Whatever. Tell tell them um, what your thoughts are on the, the future of the program and, and what they should be um, listening to is, you know, undoubtedly we're going to be getting bombarded with political ads and things um, here and there over the next few years as it relates to Medicare. But, but straight from you, um, folks who ran the Medicare program, um, what would you tell them? Well, I would... You know, I'm reminiscing about my grandmother, who was one of the first beneficiaries, sitting at her kitchen table uh, in Rockwood, Tennessee, and her telling me about this new program called Medicare that President Johnson had done. And she had a little box on her table where she kept her uh, medical bills. And she said, I wonder if it's really going to help me. I don't, my grandmother was a little skeptical. Um, and she died at 98, having been a Medicare beneficiary from the beginning. And I think the data still shows, Mark would be closer to this than I am, that if you make it to 65 in this country and are a Medicare beneficiary, congratulations, because you will have a longer lifespan. And we even, in this, in this way, we actually, at least we used to compare favorably to other countries. In many other areas of health, we don't, Mark, as you, as you pointed out. But in this area, because of the comprehensiveness of the benefits and because um, Medicare is there for them. So I would say, um, you know, congratulations. Uh, this is a great benefit, um, you know, that you can use wisely and I'll help you. It is, it is, can be hard to navigate. I had my, I helped my own uncle uh, trying to choose among um, 50 or 60 mark of your of your Medicare Part D plans that were offered in his little town. Uh, mm -hmm. He couldn't, you know, and it's 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 been um, winnowed down some now and I think made a little more um, uh, administratively feasible for someone to figure that out. But anyway, I would say, uh, don't worry about Medicare, it's gonna be there. It's, it's probably one of the most popular things that our government and our Congress have ever done. And I'm confident that we will um, inc continue to improve it. Yeah, and I just add, you know, get the facts on Medicare change. One thing about Medicare that has been clear throughout this discussion is that the program is going to have to continue to change. Its benefits need to be updated. We need to be spending more upfront on diagnosing problems early and getting out there and meeting people where they are, Ooh. making it, you know, I don't think your grandmother, Nancy, I could even imagine, I couldn't imagine 20 years mm -hmm. ago what healthcare is going to be like today. And so, be sure tr or try not to get scared off by you know political slogans of oh this change is coming and it's going to be bad good reasons to be skeptical but especially if you can pay attention to the kinds of things we've talked about today not just 
what the the costs are, but but what the outcome or or benefit implications are. Some of these changes: updating the Medicare Part D drug benefit to provide catastrophic coverage, moving more in the direction like ATO reach of protecting against um, uh, social factors that are such an impediment to to health equity today. Those can be good changes, and and I hope we can work together to help bring those benefits to um, to, to everybody's grandmother. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. On that note, um, we are right at time. Um, Nancy Endeparo, Mark McClellan, it has been a real honor and a, and a pleasure to, to be with you for this hour. Um, we had um, also Tom Scully with us and he was listening in. Uh, so um, we are thrilled to, um, again, have had this conversation, hope to have more. Um, I think maybe some new ideas came out. Um, so hope folks have been listening. Um, thanks again. For those who want more background on the basics of Medicare, um, the, some of the policy options that are at play, again, check out allhealthpolicy.org. We've got a lot of info for you. Again, um, Dr. Mark McClellan, Nancy and DeParle, thank you for spending your morning with us. We hope you have a wonderful um, rest of your Friday, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys.